come back with me, back to June 2009, uh, my first ever networking event, having just set up my agency. And I'm sitting there, and I'm shaking with fear. You see, they're about to do elevator pitches, and I have a chronic phobia of public speaking. It's about to be my turn to speak. To remedy this, I quickly knock back the final dregs of the disgusting percolated coffee they give you, and I jump up and I begin to blurt out my elevator pitch. My cheeks are going bright red with embarrassment, so much so that I can feel the heat come from them. And all of a sudden, I grind to a halt. My mind goes blank, and I can't remember what I'm saying. There's a few awkward coughs around the room, and then very feebly, I become overwhelmed, and I apologize and sit back down to a long, deafening silence. And then I look up, and I can see my competitor sitting across the room and just smirking at me and laughing. That experience haunted me for months on end, so much so that I sort of didn't want to go networking anymore. It just petrified me. So there was a lot of soul searching during that time, because I wanted to grow my agency, I wanted to go out networking. So I decided I had to get this part of my life sorted. I had to get better at public speaking, even though I was scared of it. I took some inspiration from this chap here, who actually had a chronic phobia of public speaking, believe it or not, and went on to become probably one of the best business presenters of all time. So I've been on a journey over the last seven years. It's a journey that started with that horrific first networking event, and it's a journey of training, reading, and practicing the art of public speaking. I've thrown myself into it. And I've trained under three organizations. And in preparing this tonight, I've gone through all of my training notes and bought the best stuff out of all of them to give to you this evening. The first organization is one called Toastmasters International. Show of hands, who here has heard of Toastmasters? Most people in the room. For those of you who haven't, it's the biggest public speaking training organization in the world. And there are 15,000 clubs worldwide. There are dozens here in London. So there's absolutely no reason not to try and check one out. Show of hands, who here has heard of TED Talks? I'm assuming everyone, right? If anyone hasn't heard of TED Talks, check them out. They've revolutionized how people present these days. Now, those of you who put your hands up, the chance of you shared plenty of TED Talks, you've been inspired by TED Talks. I've been quite lucky to train under a chap called John Bates. And John Bates is based in California, and he's trained over 200 real TED speakers. Some of those people that you've been inspired by, he's actually trained. And his material blew my mind. It was stuff I'd never come across in Toastmasters. I'm going to take his core bits and give them to you this evening as well. And then finally, there's an organization called Public Speakers University. And one of their head trainers is a good friend of mine. I'm going to bring some of his stuff in as well. And here's a nice collage of me speaking and getting an award. But quite frankly, who cares, right? A lot of you are probably sitting there going, well, that's nice, Marcus. You had a fear of public speaking, and now you seem a bit more confident standing up. Well, great. I'm here for me. I'm here for my agency. Well, that's exactly the point. As my presentation skills grew, so did the size of my agency, so much so that I can directly attribute £100,000 of revenue to my getting on stage and speaking in the last 12 months. I can also indirectly attribute lots of revenue as well through being composed when I'm pitching in the boardroom when I'm under pressure, when a prospect challenges me. But also, using my good friend's Lambda Films, I've been videoed a lot. And we use the videos and the presentation skills I get or I give on the videos to lead generation, sales conversion, started shooting pitch videos as well. And ultimately, all of this content, all of these opportunities have allowed me to grow my agency very quickly. But this is about you. This is about what you're going to get this evening. Spencer always says that you should aim to give times 10 return on investment, and that's what I want to give to you guys this evening. You invested your time, your energy, your money to be here, and I want to give you times 10 ROI. How am I going to give that? I'm going to try and give you things principles that if you can just apply a few of them when you walk out the door to your public speaking, you will close more business. That's my goal. That's the objective. That's what success looks like. So here's what you'll be given. The top three techniques 
for engaging your audience on the most popular TED Talks, those ones that you've perhaps shared, those ones you think, God, that's amazing. Those guys who give those TED Talks, a lot of them actually are scientists. They're dusty, dry academics. They're not natural public speakers. Yet they do these talks for 20 minutes at these events, and we all get very excited and share them. And the fact that everyone in the room, I think, has heard of TED Talks is testament to how bloody good they are. We weren't advertised by TED, we just shared them because those talks actually resonated with us. And if you can have the same impact in your talks, people will actually remember you for the right reasons and want to talk to you and your agency. I'm going to challenge each of you this evening to try and do one thing. And if you master this, you will actually sound like a professional presenter straight away. And finally, I'm going to give some preparation advice, dealing with nerves. Because actually, if you can overcome that, then you're going to come across very well on the stage. So I'd like you all to imagine something now, that you have just been given a wonderful opportunity to present in front of 500 potential customers at a conference in two weeks' time. They are your ideal customers. You've got to put together a 30-minute presentation. How do you guys feel? Yeah? OK about that? There's only about 50 here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to throw something else to the mix. I'd like you to now visualize, think of a competitor, one that really frustrates you. And you've just learned that this competitor is speaking in the 30 minute slot before you. How do you feel about that? Because this is the rub. A lot of times when we speak on stage, you're going to have a competitor in the room. And you've got this opportunity to speak, but how do you ensure that those prospects remember you and your agency and not your competitor? Well, there's four steps to creating a presentation that actually has impact. The first one is looking at principles. So how do you actually talk about your agency? How do you talk about yourself? How do you do it in a way? How do you get the tone right so that you actually connect with people? And then actually there's the presentation creation itself. How do you create the slides? How do you order it in a way that means that people aren't going to be bored? They're not going to be drifting off in their heads the whole time. And then there's public speaking skills. What are the skills that you can master to actually engage people, get them to remember you for the right reasons? And then finally, preparation. Preparing, making sure that you're ready to go out there and be remembered. So I'm going to go for each of these in order, starting off with principles. If there's one thing you guys could take from this evening, the most important principle I've come across is this. Speak to the emotional part of your audience. Speak to the emotional part of their brain. What do I mean by that? Well, we're all in sales and marketing, most of us. And we've probably heard the old adage, people buy on emotion and justify with logic, right? There's lots of theories that back this up. One of my favorites is the triune brain theory, that actually have a, it's an evolutionary psychology theory, that we have three brains over time we've evolved. The first one is the mammalian, sorry, the reptilian brain, and that's where our gut instincts come from, sex, survival. Then we have the mammalian brain, that's where emotions lie, that's the tail wagging part. And that's actually the part the audience is listening from all the time. You're making a gut instinct whether you like them. The newer part of the brain is called the neocortex, and you're talking, I'm talking from the neocortex now, but a lot of you are listening from that deeper part and going, hmm, do I like him, do I trust him, how do I feel about this? So you need to connect with people on an emotional level. And ultimately, here's the rub. People don't remember what you say. They remember how you made them feel. And here's the thing. If you don't make them feel anything, they're not going to remember you. And think about it like this. How many presentations have you sat through in your lives? Hundreds? Thousands? There's probably only a handful that you can actually remember that have actually impacted you. So you've got a choice when you can present. You can choose to actually get up and do an okay job because you're a bit nervous and get through it and sit back down and, oh, God, I'm glad that's over, and be forgotten within 24 hours. Or you can stand up and give some real value, talk about what your agency does, why you do what you do, connect with people and give them some actual value to improve their lives. So when they walk out the door, they have feel better about you, they feel connected, and they've actually got something to do to improve their lives. So how do we connect with the audience on the emotional part of the brain? Well, now I'm going to share with you how TED Talks work. I'm going to deconstruct three things that the most popular TED Talks have. So the first one is this. People connect with your messes, not your successes. What do we mean by that? People connect with your messes, not your successes. If you stand up and just say, hey, look, my agency is phenomenal. 
You know, we are the best at PPC lead gen. We're phenomenal. We've got a flawless track record. People are going to think you're either lying or exaggerating. We've all worked in organizations where there are mistakes made. But if you say, hey, look, we've made a lot of mistakes in the past. You know, we had to do a lot of things to actually get our processes really good. And now this has led to us achieving these wonderful things. Then people are going to say, yeah, I get that. I can relate to that. That's what you want your audience to say in their heads. Yeah, I can relate to that. Me too. And you're being vulnerable on stage. You're just being human and saying, hey, look, we've made a few mistakes. And you see that in a lot of TED Talks. They're quite honest about their journey of here's what went wrong, here's how we got over it, and here's the wonderful thing I've discovered now. Did anyone see President Obama last night endorsing Hillary Clinton? He did this very, very well, actually. He talked about how Hillary Clinton has got a fair share of critics. But that's what happens when you spend 40 years under the microscope. And if you spend 40 years trying to change the world, you're going to make mistakes, and she has done. And hell, he's made mistakes for being 12 years of president. But that's OK, because we're trying to do something special. We want to improve your lives as Americans. Had he gone out and say, hey, look, I'm an amazing president. Hillary's going to be just as good. We're brilliant. It's just not going to connect. You're going to think that's a lot of bullshit. But the fact he was vulnerable, he played that card absolutely beautifully last night. Not sure it's going to help with a Trump winning or not, but we'll see. We shall see. The second one leads on from this beautifully. Don't make yourself or your agency special. Make your process special. If you think of all the best TED Talks, you don't remember the actual person who gives it. It's always that TED Talk where they, they talked about being vulnerable. or They gave me that technique to feel really confident. People like learning processes and processes that have been discovered. So when you're talking about your agency, talk about your processes that are special, the how you got to them. At Fountain, we talk about our three-stage approach to take the risk out of marketing for our clients. And I talk about that as being special, not me. And that seems to connect with people more. They like to know about that because ultimately they can apply my three-stage approach and not have to work with me. But so I'm giving them some value there. And that leads to the final point. You are not the hero. Your audience is the hero. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people, I think, feel that they have to sort of put on some sort of persona when they come on stage and have to talk about how great they are and everything. And also, the biggest mistake in marketing, I believe, in presenting is focusing on what you want to say rather than what your target audience wants to hear. So it's not actually about you or your agency. It's about the audience. And I'm going to show another slide now to illustrate this point a bit better. And it really hit home for me when I saw this slide. Are there any Star Wars fans in the audience? Well, of course, we're creators, right? All well, the guys put their hands up. This slide from a book called Resonate by Nancy Girard sums it up beautifully. That's you, the presenter. You're Yoda. The audience is Luke. What am I actually trying to say here is focus on giving real value. Focus on the fact that each of these people listening to you, they're going to have to walk out the door at some point, and you want them to walk with something valuable. And if you focus on actually trying to improve their lives by imparting your knowledge about branding, about SEO, about video production, whatever it is, so that they can actually do it themselves, it shows that you really care about them, that you give a shit. And that actually is going to connect with them and make them think, oh, I like this person. I really like this guy. I like what they're about. I like their agency. Actually, hell, they stand out from the other people on the stage. I better go speak to them at the end. And that's what you want. But you might be thinking, well, how do I talk about myself? Well. Does anyone know what the most popular TED talk of all time is? Simon Sinek. Exactly. Start with why. So, okay, show of hands, who has seen Simon Sinek start with why? It's the same old crowd, isn't it? Okay, for those of you who haven't, check it out. It's my favorite. And in, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to explain his process that's special. Not Simon Sinek. He's not saying I'm really special. He's got a process that he's made special. And in it, he calls it the golden circles. And it, Basically, it's saying that you need to talk about your why. Why do you run your agency? Why do you, I was, Michael, I was chatting to you actually beforehand, and you had that experience. Someone was asking you about your pitch, and they asked, well, why do you actually do what you do? And you talked about your love for design. And they said, that's so much more powerful than if you're just saying, oh, yeah, I enjoy graphic design, you know, or I'm just a graphic designer. For those of you who haven't seen the talk, let me explain this process. I'm going to use me as an example. What do I do? Well, my name's Marcus. I run a digital marketing agency. We do lead gen through pay-per-click and conversion. 
how do you do that? Well, we take people's websites, we send traffic to them and encourage people to pick up the phone and inquire. Great. Why do you do it? I love meeting businesses and organizations that are creating real value in the world and helping them grow, get their message out there and acted upon. I also love data-driven marketing, forecasting, taking the risk out of marketing for my clients so that they can feel confident when they press go and give me their marketing spend. And all of a sudden, you're now seeing a different side of me, an emotive side. Here's what I like to do. Here's who I am. And that's how we connect with people. Yeah, and it appeals to the older part of the brain. The why appeals to the emotional part. The what and the how appeals to the neocortex, the newer part. And that part really actually is how we talk a lot in networking. It's like, oh, yeah, here's what I do. And we all forget that. Remember the whys. As Simon Sinek would say, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Half the room know that already. The other half, please watch that TED Talk. It's phenomenal. We're now going to go on to how you create your presentations. What I'm about to give you is a template for you to follow. So when you do have an opportunity to speak, follow this template and you'll have a presentation that will stand out, I guarantee. So we're going to begin with the opening. When you first come on the stage, pause. Count to five in your head. The reason is you want to engage people. This is the most important part of your presentation, because if you lose people at this stage, they're going to go off in their head the whole time. You don't want that. If you pause, you can compose yourself, and they're going to think, oh, what's happening next? You're having a presence on stage. So I pause and I count to five. Then I open my mouth, and I do something different. So for example, I start with a story, or a quote, or a straw poll if you don't like starting with a story. By show of hands, who thinks this? I was doing talks up and down the country two years ago to business networking groups, and they were small sort of SME types, and I assume they probably wouldn't like me because I run an agency that does SEO, and SEO's got a bad rep, lots of snake oil, etc. So I thought, how can I do something really different and address this, because they're not going to like me straight away. So I came up with a word association game. So I would start and say, right, I'd like to begin by playing a word association game with you. So what I'm going to do is show you an image. And I'd like you to shout out the first thing that comes to mind. So I show a picture of a cat, and they shout out dog. And I show a picture of salt, and they shout out pepper or vinegar. And then I show a slide that says the word marketing agencies. And they all boo and hiss. And someone stood up once and goes, you're all effing crooks. They get really angry. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, like, isn't that really bizarre? Like, let, let's observe this for a second. Why is it? You know, I go around the country, I get the same response. Why are marketing agencies down there with bankers and politicians? And then I think it's probably, I say it's probably because lots of people have lost money through marketing agencies. Show of hands who has lost money through a marketing agency. Everyone puts their hands up, right? My name is Marcus Hemsley, I'm the director of Fountain. It's my job to stop this. I want to raise the standard of marketing by accurate forecasting. And straight away I can begin my presentation. And no one else who was doing those sort of events had an opening like that. So straight away I've engaged them. And I've overcome a nice objection because, you know, some people don't like us creatives as much as perhaps we should be liked. Now we move to the introduction. So some of you are probably thinking, well, on second, Marcus, we just had the introduction. That was the opening. It's the same thing. No, it's not. The opening's job is to get people's attention, to make them think, oh, shit, this is a different speaker. Sit up and go, wow, he's interesting. The introduction is actually to introduce yourself. That's the point. So when you do speak about yourself to build credibility, remember those principles, those three principles. Be humble. Talk about your messes as well as your successes. And just be vulnerable on stage. Be honest. And mention your why, because then you'll connect with people. So you're already distinguishing yourself quite a lot from other speakers. You're starting with something interesting, and then you're connecting them on an emotional level. Straight away, the audience is like, wow, I haven't seen anything like this before. But then straight away, make it about them. Okay? Don't bang on about yourself too much, because you will start losing them, regardless of how emotive it is. Tell them exactly what they'll get from the day, and then whet their appetite a bit. Be a bit clickbaity with some of your bullet points. Don't reveal everything up front because they might assume they already know about it. We then get to the middle. And this is where you actually start giving your information about your agency, what you do. Before you start each section, build up some anticipation. You know, Don't go straight into it. So we say something like, at Fountain, we spent months trying to get this technique right to reduce our clients' ad word spend, and we finally cracked it. And I can't wait to tell you about it. It's 
and go into it. If you want people to remember your points, hang them on stories. This is really important. We memorize stuff that's on stories. And let me explain why. We'll give you an example, rather. Someone came to see me, a friend of mine. He said, Marcus, I've been to this brilliant conference. You'd love it. It's got all of these wonderful speakers. They were great. And I said, cool, what did they talk about, Dave? And he said, you know what? I can't remember. Actually, no, there's one woman who told me this story about her startup. And there's actually other guy who told me about how his business went bankrupt. And I realized quite quickly all of the things that he could remember from that conference just the day before were stories. They're wrapped in stories. And we're going to get more into why that is in a little bit. But ultimately, if you want to, hang a po if you want to make a point, hang it on a story. It doesn't have to be once upon a time. It could just be a case study. It could just be an example, a quick anecdote, but just something just to tie it in there. Because our brains aren't that wired for taking in lots of facts and memorizing, but they are for stories. You can see a story in your mind's eye. The ending. When you wrap it up, summarize and have three core things to take away. Why three? Well, let me tell you a story. I was getting trained by John Bates in California, and he said to me, Marcus, how do humans count? I was like, what? So how do people count? So in sequential order, what are we talking about? He said, no, people count one, two, three, many. And his point is, is that we don't really remember much more than three. So slides with anything more than list of three things on are a bad idea. So just give them three core things. So think to yourself, what are the three most important bits of information I want my audience to take away? And genuinely think from their perspective whether this will change their life. And if it will, as long as we change their life as in, oh my god, I've never looked back, but it could be, oh, that's really useful for my job and my career prospects, because a lot of them may be marketing managers. Always ends on a call to action. I've messed up with this a few times. I've given talks and thought, oh, they all love me. That's great. And you know, got great feedback through the, you know, the people who set up the event. Didn't have a call to action. Didn't capture the data. Didn't get any leads from it. So try and get them to do something. Make it a motive if you can. And loop it back to the beginning. So loop it back to a story. That, example I gave when I did the word association game, I ended on a story about a guy who lost 30 grand because he didn't know about the three most important numbers in digital marketing to take the risk out of it. So I gave this whole talk about the three most important numbers. A lot of people get upset with marketing agencies because they lose money, and I talk about the story of someone who did and just wrap it around that way. I'm going to talk about slides now because I use Prezi, but tonight I've been forced to use key Keynote. Fine. But all of you guys will be using some form of presentation software. And, the go and basically, this philosophy here is less is more. But there's an expression in the English language that a lot of you will be familiar with. That expression is death by PowerPoint. <laughs> now, there's a problem with that. Because if you've got lots of slides, lots of text on it, people can't do two things at once. They can't listen to me as the presenter and read reams of text. It'd be the same as trying to drink a glass of water whilst breathing. <coughs> which I'm not going to try and do. But if you insist, for those of you who think, no, I like having lots of bullet points, lots of text on my slides, because you know, it gives me something to remember or whatever, fine. If you insist on having lots of text on your slides, then this is how you need to present. OK? You take a seat in the audience. Can everyone please begin reading? And then you wait for everyone to read. And then you say, right, next slide. We're now going to move on to public speaking skills. I'm going to start with the most important thing you can add to your presentation to make it actually memorable. And I've already hinted at this already. It's, of course, telling a story. This is another shot from Nancy Drart's book, Resonate. And she said that campfires have been replaced by projector bulbs, but the power of the story has eluded presenters in the workplace. And this is the big mistake people make. They don't put stories in there. Why are stories so powerful? Well, I think for the lifetime of our, our species, you know, arguably 200,000 years Homo sapiens, maybe the last 10 or 20,000 years we've had language, we've communicated via stories. So our brains are receptive to stories. We restore information via stories. Only 500 years ago was the printing press. Very few people could read and write. We remember stories so much more easily. So you should put some in your presentation. Now, let me help you with some, with some storytelling tactics and give you some quick wins you can take with you. The first quick win, start where the action is. I'm going to use 
the story I gave at the very beginning as an example. So, and I started my story saying, so I began my agency in 2008, and my friend Alex rung me up and said, do you want to come networking? And I said, no, because I get a bit nervous. And I'd, That's boring. You've lost people straight away. I began. I was sitting down. I was shaking with fear. Wow, what's happening? If you can, and be careful with this, tell your story in the present tense. Because that way, the audience can visualize it a little bit better. So when I told that story, I was talking about, I'm sitting there, I'm shaking, I stand up. I didn't say I was sitting there. I, it just helps people visualize it a little bit more. And then finally, one trick that I love is holograms and timelines. So a bit of audience participation. Where was my competitor sitting in the room? The one that was smirking at me over there, right? So if I want to talk about him later on, I point about my competitor. And where did I give my elevator pitch? It was over there, wasn't it? So I can talk about the problems that happened over there. So you're anchoring parts of your story to the stage. Timelines I love. Timelines is brilliant. So in the West, we read from left to right. So most of us think, when it comes to looking at time on the stage, that from your perspective, the past is over here, right? And the future's over here because people read from left to right. So unfortunately, though, I'm the other way around. So in my head, the future's over here and the past is over here. And a lot of people make this mistake. They start walking from the audience's perspective the wrong way when they talk about the past. And little things like that can tweak people in their unconscious and say, oh, I don't trust this guy or this girl. I don't know, something that's incongruent. So if you do tell a story and you talk about the past and you move from past to the future, Go to your right. It'll feel weird, but go to it. It's a very cheeky little trick. I'm now going to talk about one more thing with storytelling, and that's to get VACO. What does VACO mean? Let me run through it quickly. It's using descriptive language. So talking about visual, visual words. So I talked about my red cheeks in the story. Auditory, a few awkward coughs from around the room. Kinesthetic, my cheeks were burning, so red. Olfactory, that rancid taste of the coffee. Now, obviously, you don't have to do all that in every story you use about your agency, because you'll sound a bit nuts. But it's funny, I was mentoring a guy who was giving a TEDx talk, and he told a story, he didn't have any descriptive language. I said, just pepper a few little things in there. He talked about his teacher at school, and I said, look, rather than her slamming the book down, slamming the, blue, the old blue book down. And just little things like that brought his story to life a bit. So try that. I'm now going to get some quick wins for presenting, but I'm mindful the food's coming out. So, Pete, what do you reckon? Should I stop at this juncture, or should I keep going? Yeah? OK. Some quick wins for presenting. This guy's one of my favorite presenters, Bill Clinton. They say when Bill speaks, he makes you feel like you're the only person in the room. How does he do that? He does that through deep eye contact. So we all know when you're doing public speaking, it's good to make eye contact, right? But the mistake everyone makes is they kind of like look over people's heads, so you sort of you know, skim it, it's a bit nervous to look people in the eye. What Bill Clinton does is he has lots of individual conversations. So he speaks to someone over here, and then picks someone at the back to look at, or someone over there, and says a few words to the person at the front, and just has lots of individual conversations with people. That means that every person around the room gets a look and feels slightly more engaged. Body language. The thing about body language is it should be congruent with the way that you're moving, but use gestures. It's good to use the room to move around. Why is it good to move around? Because it makes your, your presentation look more entertaining. It's, there's more variance. It's going to keep people's attention more. The mistake a lot of people make is they don't have a good neutral position to come back to. They look a bit awkward. They kind of stand on the stage a bit like this, or they're playing in their pockets, or they're, they're not looking natural. So they need to have a stance where you just can come back to and feel OK. The one that I've been taught is this neutral stance here, where you just sort of stand like that. Just you'll put your hands as if you were taking a bit of paper and just sort of pull them like this. And it's funny, I was watching Wimbledon a few weeks ago, Andrew Murray run, and they followed him afterwards into the All England Club. And you had the Duchess of Cambridge, or Prince William and uh, whatever her face is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm a Republican, I can't stand the royal family. But what I did see was both of them walk up, Prince William and Kate Middleton, like this, and they had their neutral stance. They knew the cameras were on them, and they had a very natural pause. And it's, it's good to have a stance where you just feel authoritative and you can come back to when you're a bit stuck. OK, 20 quid for anyone who knows who this bloke is. Good, non-new Manchester either. This guy's called Jerry Spence. 
He was a big trial lawyer in the States. He didn't lose a case from 1969 to 1997. He then went on to write a book called How to Argue and Win Every Time, which sounds very cocky, but hey, he did, so that's fine. <laughs> one of the things that he talks about, though, one of the reasons he felt he won so many cases, was he used vocal variety. So when he was, when he was giving his resting case to the jury, he would use fast and slow variety, but he would also lace his words of emotion. He'd make people care. And the way he would practice was a bit bizarre. He'd get the phone book and read people's names, but lace those words with different emotions. So if it was anger, like, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, which is a bit odd. I don't think you should do that. <laughs> but what I think you should do is just bear that in mind, that having vocal variety, speeding up when you're excited, or slowing down when you want to make a more salient point, will have an impact. And also lacing words of emotion, frustrated by your competitor, whatever it might be, it just brings your presentation to life a lot more. I'm not going to talk about Brexit, but what I am going to talk about is a great bit of advice I got about the speed at which you should speak. That you should imagine that everyone in the audience is French. In a nice way, I have no problem with the French. But they, so they speak English as a second language. So speak to them at that rate. Because here's the thing, when you're having a one-to-one -one with someone, I'm chatting to Pete at the bar or whatever, he's listening a lot more intently. His brain's moving faster because he knows he's going to get called on to speak. When you're an audience member, you're much more relaxed. You're in a sort of slower brain cycle. So when you speak, you need to learn to speak at a slower rate on stage. You always need to learn to speak again differently to how you speak when you're chatting to your mate at the pub or whatever. And that's the mistake people make. They talk on stage like they're having a chat with someone, and they're going too fast which means that people inevitably switch off, go into their heads and don't listen. So, bonjour. OK, the challenge, the big challenge for everyone. The one thing that will make you sound like a professional presenter, that is phasing out all filler words. Uh, um, you know, like, so. Phase them out. Could you imagine how I started saying, so um, tonight my, my name is um, Marcus Hemsley and um, I'm uh, going to talk to you, well, you know, about public speaking. No. My name's Marcus Hemsley. Tonight I'm going to speak to you about public speaking. It's just that difference. You almost come across as a professional presenter. And it's not a difficult thing to phase out. I think, picking on you again, Michael, you said actually you managed to phase it out yourself with just a bit of practice. And that's gives you that edge, you just look so much more professional if you can do that. If you ever go to Toastmasters, they have a buzzer for ers and ums. Shock therapy, we call it, in a very lovely way. Preparation. You've got the principles sorted, you've created your templates, and you've practiced your public speaking skills. You've phased out your ers and ums. It's a week before your big presentation where your competitor's going to be there. And motivation's waning a bit when it comes to the preparation and running through. You've got your slides, but it's been a long day at the office. So I really want to spend my evening running through presentations. Well, if you want some motivation, you can look no further than the Bates equation for public speaking preparation. This is actually a thing, of course. If you're nodding away, of course. What you do is you take the length of your talk and you multiply it by the number of people in the audience. So if I'm doing a half an hour talk to 100 people, that's 3,000 minutes of human life I'm responsible for. <laughs> Which actually works really well. Because if you think about it, actually, everyone's life and their time is quite valuable. So if you don't give a very good presentation and it doesn't actually impact them, you're wasting lots of people's life. It's not very nice, is it? <laughs> this chap here. How much preparation do you think this guy did before he launched a new iPhone or a new product? Well, it was one hour for every minute of his presentation. Which, when you do the Bates equation for public speaking motivation, you think, well, actually, there are millions of minutes of people's lives he was responsible for when he launched a product. <coughs> but ultimately, the big barrier to all of us is nerves. A lot of us get it. And there's a few techniques I'm going to share with you to deal with nerves. The first one is listening to my man Snoop Dogg. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I think it's bad response in Manchester. Peter and I are both canaries, so you guys can back off. And we're coming straight back to the Premier League. And I didn't superimpose that. Snoop himself is a self-confessed canary. Snoop says, before he, gets, before he goes on stage, he focuses on not being nervous, but being of service. What does that actually mean? Well, it goes back to the point of actually creating value for your audience, that if you're thinking, oh, God, what are they going to think of me? They're going to be judging me. You're being really selfish, God damn it. Actually, it's about them. It's about the audience. If you have got a really useful thing to tell them, if your agency does wonderful things, if you've got a way of looking at branding or marketing that can help them improve their lives, it's not about you, it's about them. It's about focusing on the audience. And actually by thinking about, OK, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to give you some advice that hopefully when you walk out the door will be useful. That helps take the nerves away. You're not looking inwards, but you're looking outwards. Ultimately, though, you will always be a bit nervous. You'll always have those butterflies in your stomach. And the trick is to get those butterflies to fly in formation. But how do you do that? Ultimately, it's practice. For me, I have a memory bank now of positive memories with public speaking. And I visualize, before I go on the stage, things going well in the past and then things going well in the future. So it's a simple visualization technique that I use. But how do you create lots of positive memories when you're petrified and you don't really want to be getting up and doing lots of speaking at the minute, but you know you kind of should to grow your agency? Well, that's where Toastmasters comes in. Toastmasters International. There are clubs all around the world. There'll be a club near you. And it's a safe environment to practice public speaking. It costs about £10 a month. You can turn up twice. And if it goes wrong, it doesn't matter. You get feedback right away. And this is the organization that I attribute my ability to get over public speaking to. So I'd like you all to do something now. If you don't mind getting out your phones and going to Google, I'd like you all just to open a browser, go to Google, and type in Toastmasters plus the area where you live, providing it's a relatively populous area. If you live in a hamlet somewhere, then maybe you won't find a Toastmasters club. And what you'll have in front of you, then, is an opportunity. You'll probably have a search result with a club near you. And what I would recommend is just turning up as a guest and just observing. Now, you don't have to go down this route. I'm not trying to convert you all into Toastmasters. But at least you know it's there, that when you want to practice in a safe environment, that's where you go. And that was the biggest thing that I learned, the biggest opportunity I had to improve my public speaking. And I decided to take it. So in summary, three points. Connect with people on an emotional level. They won't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. If you don't make them feel anything, they won't remember you. Tell stories. That's how they actually remember your points. Bring your speech to life with stories. And focus on your audience. Say to yourself, what are the core things I can give them to improve their lives? And then really focus on giving it to them, because they'll feel that energy, they'll connect with you, and it will help with the nerves as well. And in that spirit of giving, I have a little gift for you. I don't do this for a living. I own two agencies. I've just bought a second one. But I do practice this a lot. And if any of you guys do have a big pitch coming up or a big presentation and you think, oh, actually, I wonder what Marcus would say about this or I wonder if Marcus could look at my slides, I'm happy to do that for free as sort of an introduction because I'm part of the other stream anyway. So I know all the more guys in the other London group than I do with you guys. So. I'm going to leave some cards just down there. Grab it, drop me an email, add me on LinkedIn. I'm often in London, so I'll go for coffee and talk about your presentations. Thank you so much for listening. I can assure you, nothing is more terrifying than being the speaker on After the Man Who's Just Told You <laughs> How to Deliver an Amazing Talk. So whilst you were all enjoying your dinners, I was desperately trying to work out how to remove all the ums and ers and thinking of lots of stories to put into my presentation. So here goes. I'm really lucky. So I get to do an amazing job. I get to work with so many uh, wonderful agencies. It's lovely to see so many clients here today. One of the things that's fascinated me over the many years I've been doing this is the difference between some of our clients that achieve amazing things and those that just tick along. 
So some of our clients have sold out for millions. We had one last month, uh, sold out, did really, really well. We've been with them the whole journey from startup all the way through to exit. And yet also last month, we had a business that had to close its doors. It wasn't quite doing so well. And in between those that do really well and those that don't quite make it, we have lots of people, agencies in between, just coping with the daily challenges of growing an agency, all of the challenges that you know and will understand. And it's always fascinating to me the difference between those that achieve great things and those that tick along. And, and of course, there's many things that the top performing ones do. And many of you will have heard it in other the previous talks I've done and seen it in the videos. But one thing that we see as a key trait amongst the top performing ones is they're really good at getting gigs. And the reason they, they do it is because of what it generates them. So Spencer's famous talk on the 30, 30, 30, 10 approach to marketing talks about where new business comes from. And in there, he talks about how the top performing agencies use speaking gigs to get them work and to get them the clients they really, really want. So today, I'm going to share with you some of the things that our top performing clients do when it comes to, to getting gigs. And it's really practical stuff. It's stuff that's not going to cost you a lot of money. It's things that you can implement tomorrow in your agencies. But it starts with an email. And it's an email from someone, someone many of you will know. It's an agency collective member who's been a member right from the start, joined us in July uh, 2013, three years ago. And at the time, his agency was struggling. It wasn't picking up the clients that they really were hoping for. Was thinking about actually potentially laying off a couple of members of staff and was looking for a bit of a kickstart. And they sat down with, with Spencer and I, and Spencer gave them a suggestion and said, look, you need to go and win new business. You need to go out there, build fame, go and get some speaking gigs. Gave them a couple of talks. 12 months later, he sent us this email. Chris Donnelly from Verb said, hi, so much of the advice you've given me since we met a year ago has led to us being where we are now. Business is flowing in faster than we can manage, and therefore we can hire more. For War from Warren and I, I just want to say a big thank you. Here's Chris. This is his LinkedIn profile. This is his Twitter profile. You may notice there's a similarity between these two pictures, other than it being the same person, by, by the way. <laughs> and that is the starting point for the, the, the tips today, which is if you would like to pick up more new business, have a really full pipeline of clients you really, really want to work with, so you can pick and choose who you want to work with, then you need to tell people what you're going to do. And the starting point is to upload an image of you speaking to social media profiles. The second step to this is then mention that you are a keynote speaker for a particular topic. And the key is to get niche with this. So a lot of people here, obviously, in the field of, of marketing, if you say you specialize in marketing, you're not going to get many gigs. Because there are, well, there's 50 people in the room that could say the same thing, and you're not going to be very memorable. However, if you can say that you're a keynote speaker, let's say particular, a particular strand of marketing. Say, look, we specialize in branding. You've got a higher chance. You say you specialize in branding and packaging, you've got a higher chance still. You, get a, you say that you're a specialist speaker in branding and packaging for food companies. Well, that's going to stick. And guess what? You can then find the events where your particular client are going to really want to hear the expert in that particular field. So the more focused and niche you can get in terms of your topic, the better. Have a think about this. Have a think about what you could be the best in the world at speaking about. The best in the world. What subject would you speak in? If I said to you, right, you've got to speak on something where no one else can touch you. You are the number one authority. The chances are it won't be broad. It will be really, really niche. In my case, it might be the 92-93 season when Norwich finished, <laughs> finished third in the Premier League. Moving on from that and the fine year that Jeremy Goss had that, that year, I encourage you to think about niching. And then constantly communicate that you are available for speaking opportunities on your chosen subject. Now, when I say constantly communicate, I don't actually mean constantly communicate, because that would be a bit odd. Meeting people at a networking event saying, hi, my name's Peter, and I'm constantly available for speaking <laughs> opportunities on my available subject wouldn't get me many friends. However, there's a client that does this brilliantly well. 
So what they do is they start right at the top of the process. So they, when they're thinking about creating a talk, they'll come up with a title. And then they'll share that with people. And they say, look, I'm thinking of writing a talk on the seven steps to such and such. Anyone got any ideas what the seven steps might be? And they'll put it out there. And they'll get comments, and they'll get feedback, and they'll get engagement. And what they'll then do is they'll say, right, I think I've got the seven steps. Can you guess what they are? And they'll get some more feedback. And then they might say, right, I'm taking Friday off. I'm turning off my emails and I'm going to write this talk. And they're just subtly letting you know they're writing this talk on the subject. They'll take little pictures of their notes, those like, wonderful mind maps that, that, uh, that they do. They will share the first, the first slide or little snippets of it. And then when it's, once it's created, they'll say, look, I'm, I'm going away to practice it. And they'll record little bits of them practicing it and share three minute clips all the time, subtly reminding everyone that you are, they are the specialist speaker on this particular subject, but also creating a ton of content and engagement at the same time for free, and it's so, so easy. And then once they have created it, they'll, they'll often pick and say, look, one of my seven steps was this, and I've written a blog about it. Now, they haven't actually done a talk at this point, but you definitely know that they do it, and you definitely know that they're an expert on this. I'd encourage you all to think about, again, what could you be the, the, the leading expert in the world on and then just to start to think about how you can create some noise about this. None of this is going to cost you any money to do. So the second tip. Oh, before we do that, actually, showreel. I quite like this story. Because how many people here have a showreel of them talking? Just out of interest. OK. So could it, how did you create this? And why, well, why did you create it, first of all? So it's for the agency, it's not me personally. Is that right. still the same? Yeah, no, for you personally, so your personal show reel of you talking. Oh, I don't have that. <laughs> yeah. Do you Go on, have you done it? Um, yeah, I've just recently done a public speaking course of which I've been training to do a TEDx talk. So, uh, wow. so that was with um, London Real TV, which is a YouTube um, channel. And um, so I've been trained by uh, Brian Rose, who's been actually used the presenter and, uh, and one of the um, actual TEDx talks, um, Clapham, I think he actually runs. And um, so we've recently, I've just been filmed, and I only just got the video last night after six weeks, of which um, it's amazing actually seeing the video of yourself that you filmed on your iPhone or whatever it was, of the ums and the ahs, and, the, and you're quite a confident person sat around chatting to people, and then you realise as soon as the camera comes on, you're a complete idiot in front of the camera. And then um, and it was just amazing, and we, we got in front of, we actually stood in the studio about six weeks ago, and, um, and filmed, and my, my talks about actual, sort of um, collaboration off the back of working with lots of different types of creative people and not necessarily trying to do everything myself or our agency, but bringing other experts in. And that was what, what my passion was about. So yeah, we, we did that recently. And it was quite, quite interesting to see myself back me. <laughs> Amazing. So have you got, uh, I don't know, a 90 second clip of, that you could send someone to say, look, would you like me to, to speak at this event? Here's a clip of me in action. Yeah, possibly, yeah, yeah, because I've got the, the, the I'm, I'm on the intro as well as the actual, yeah, the, the 10 minute talk. And, awesome. And, and I've just been applying for TEDx talks recently, uh, which I didn't get through this week, but I got through to the next stage, of which they expect a, a two minute talk. So yeah, and, and I've just recently um, been to the TEDx Liverpool to actually see what it was like to actually be there. And I didn't realize I sat on the front row in between all the, all the talks about to go on stage. So I got to find out right in the middle of it all the nerves of what they were feeling, what they were going to get up, and everybody had a completely different aspect. Um, you know, somebody was doing music, somebody was doing a girl who was saying that she was a complete loser in her life, and then suddenly she climbed Kilimanjaro, and you know, all these amazing people. You do walk out there thinking, I really need to get my act together. Um, but I totally recommend going to a TEDx talk and feeling it for real as well. Yeah. Amazing. Some some good tips. So. You all have creds documents or case studies for, for the work that you do. So if you're looking to do more speaking, this is your creds document. This is uh, an opportunity for you in just 90 seconds just to showcase what you do. Now, I was chatting to, to a group of, of clients, and they were saying, well, we've, we can't do that. We've never done a talk before. How can we produce a show when we've never done a talk? And one of our clients started laughing and said, oh, well, I can let you into a secret, because they had a show room and it looked quite good. And uh, I've just realized when I'm sharing secrets, they be no longer become secrets. So uh, I did ask permission for, for this person to share this, this story. I, 
they insisted that they would remain nameless. So, so anyway, so Brian said um, that what, <laughs> what, what he, he did was, so he wanted to show them. And he hadn't done any talks before. So what he did was really cheeky. He hired the local town hall, and he went along with a few change of clothes, a couple of iPhones, and he made sure that they had a lectern there. And then what he did was he filmed himself talking and presenting on a particular subject, uh, one behind a lectern, and then he sort of moved over here a bit and got changed, and then one without out a lectern, and loads of and different backgrounds on, on the screen. And he created what looked like him talking at three different events on three different subjects. And if you think about it, in, in a show rule, you don't really see the audience. It's just, you know, you might, it's the top of people's heads for perception, just to show that you're not talking to an empty room. Just for clarity, can you just zoom out now on this camera to show I'm not talking to, <laughs> to an empty room? Yeah. So he created this show reel for himself. For, well, he had to hire the, the town hall, but pretty much for, for next to nothing. And all of a sudden, he looked super professional and it hadn't really cost him anything. And in terms of the gigs that he won off the back of that, being able to say, look, I've done this before, it was phenomenal. So I'd encourage you, if you're serious about this, and, and there's plenty of reasons to be serious about this in terms of what we see, the results that, that our clients get from, from doing this, you can, you can do this tomorrow. You can go and create your showreel tomorrow and position yourself as the expert and then see what happens. Step two is all about focus. Now, those of you who've heard me speak before, you will know I'm a massive fan of focus, the power of focus. We were talking about it earlier. I can't remember who with I think we, we were talking about it, weren't we? Um, uh, it's so important, and there's a couple of reasons why. I'd encourage you all to think about who you really want to speak to, your ideal client, and really profile them in detail. Who would you like to be in a room with talking to? And then work out where they hang out and who the key influencers are. So one of our clients did this again really, really well. They were an agency. They, they were a general agency, but I badgered them sufficiently for them to realize that they needed to, to focus on a niche. And they had a, a niche offering. So they focused on, uh, what was it? It was internal comms. So they did internal comms. And they eventually took that internal comms and they focused it on a particular niche as well. Initially, it was just internal comms. And they worked out who the four or five key influencers were in internal comms. And the way they started their, their journey was to say, we're running a survey. We want to find out uh, all about employee engagement. So we're running a survey. What questions would you like to ask in this survey? So they got the key influencers engaged at that point. And then they said, here's the survey that we've created. Before it goes out, any suggestions for what you want to add? So these key influencers are now highly engaged in this process. And then they sent it out. And guess what? They got the key influencers to help share it. So now they're involved in the process. And the survey results came back. And they produced a beautifully branded piece and sent it out. They themed it around zombies and, and employee engagement. And they sent it out as a, a, a hard copy. And they also got the, uh, at a digital copy, which the influencers sent out far and wide. And as a result of that, and then positioning themselves as an expert in that niche, they won a load of speaking gigs off the back of it, which resulted in a load of new clients. And their average spend rocketed, their average project value rocketed, their profitability rocketed, everything shot up, all from this, this focus and niche and being really targeted about who it was that they were looking for. Everything becomes easier. You can then work out not just who the key influencers are, but where they hang out, what events do they go to. They're not general events, they're specific events. And you might have a couple of clients already in this niche. You can ask them, what events do you go to? Where do you hang out? And find out, and then see if you can tag along. One of our, so actually, it was the, one of the very first agency collective events. I was chatting to, to someone there, and they gave me this tip. And I said, how long have you been in business? They said, oh, about, about a year. Cool, ah, well, tell me about the size of your agency. What have you been up to? And they, they told me that they'd done half a million in their first year. Half a million quid in the first year, astonishing. I said, well, how did you do it? Come on, I need to, I need to know so I can tell everyone. And they, they told me, it was very simple. They said, we worked out from the outset who we wanted and the events that, that they hung, might hang out at. And they wrote down a list of eight events, you know, big events that they'd really want to speak at throughout the course of the year. And they just set about contacting them. They worked out who the organizers were and who they had connections with and set about contacting them. 
So I think they, in their first year, they, they got gigs at five of those events, and those five gigs resulted in work totaling half a million quid. Interestingly, they then got very busy, stopped doing this stuff, and suffered a dip as a result, and are now getting, getting back onto it. So this isn't just something you do once, it's a constant thing. I love this tip. So a client t told, me, told me this, uh, another cheeky little tip that you can, you can use and it won't cost you anything. They said what they do is that they go to events that they want to speak at and they look at, they chat to the other speakers. So you know after the, the event, the speak, you can go up and chat to the speaker and they gather their details and they make sure that the, the speaker at least remembers them for, for something. They don't do, do the, the, their pitch sort of there and then, but they at least exchange cards and they make sure the speaker, speaker remembers them. And then a couple of days later, they say, they drop them an email and say, hey, I don't suppose you remember me. We chatted afterwards. We talked about this or this or that. But I, I'm organizing an event and I don't suppose you'd like to be a speaker on the panel, would you? To which inevitably the answer is, yeah, I'd love to because that's the sort of thing that they do. And what they do is they bring these experts who've been the best speakers around, bring them on the panel, either put themselves on the panel as the fourth or fifth member or the facilitator of it, the center of attention, and then good stuff happens as a result. So they're very, very quickly and easily and simply using these other speakers to help build their own profile. And guess what? If these speakers have got a following and, you ask, and they're speaking at your event, then ask them to share. And I'll talk about the power of partnerships later. There's an, a neat idea that, that um, someone told me that I think will, you'll find really, really useful. But I love this idea of just almost crowdsourcing your, your event, borrowing from other speakers, using partners, this genuine collaborative approach to bring people together and to subtly uh, put you at the center of it. The third tip's probably the, the most important, which is take action. It's pretty much the final tip of all of the talks that, that I do, because I meet so many agencies that talk a good game, that come to these talks and then do nothing about it. And I think that's such a shame. It's a real shame because there's so many good ideas. There's so many great content in the agency collective group and to see it go to waste or just pass through our minds and then nothing happen as a result is, is a real shame. So if, if you can do one or two things as a result of this presentation, that would be really, really neat. Here are some things that might help. So again, another tip from a client, they, they talked about the importance of thinking big. You know, this idea of who are the, the, the eight events I really want to speak at this year, or which are the eight events do I really want to speak at? But also they said that something always good happened when they talked at the event, even if it was a really, really small one. Because there was always someone in the room that knew someone who knew someone. And it often didn't just happen then. They could attribute a lot of their new business to stuff that they did three, four, five years ago at talks. They exchanged cards, someone added, was added to the database, good things happen. So don't be, think big, but don't be afraid to start, start small. It's great that you've started, well, to be fair, you haven't started small, you've gone right, right to TED, TEDx talk. So um, that, that's really neat. How, if you do get a speaking opportunity, I'd encourage you to take it. Good things will happen, I promise and build partnerships. A couple of things I've seen clients do that are neat here. If you can, so if you, once you've worked out who you want to speak at your events, you can then work out who has access to them. And you can go to those people, and if there's a ticket price in your event, which I encourage you, you to, to put, by the way, you can go to them and say, to your partners and say, hey, here's a discount off our ticket price, or even here's a free ticket. There's a limited 10, 10 usage. And you can go out to your partners, and if you want 50 people at your event, you only need five partners to bring 10 people using this discount code, and you've got your 50 people. To try and get 50 people yourself is gonna be hard work. So I'd encourage you to, to use partners. And the key to partnerships, any partnership ever, is to really deeply understand what it is that they're looking to achieve. If you can achieve your objectives by helping someone else achieve theirs, that's magic. And a client of ours did this wonderfully well many years ago. Does anyone here remember the old Business Link? Business Link. Back in the day, the old Business Link. So this was a government organization that were, its sole purpose was to help small businesses, to provide them with advice, to help them grow. <coughs> and they were looking to, to run events and bring in marketing companies, which, which my client was at the time, to, to talk to their, their community. And what my client worked out was they had a massive challenge with something called GVA. 
GVA was gross value added. It was a measure that Business Link were forced to report back to the government on. So the government gave them all this money to go and help small businesses, and the only way the government could know whether or not it's made a difference was to show what gross value had been added. So we take a business turning over 100 grand, and a year later they're turning over 200 grand, they've gone from three staff to six staff, that type of stuff. But no one likes filling out forms. And so it was a real challenge for Business Link to get this data. And once my client realized this, they said, well, how about we put on an event where through the coursework, through the workshop of the event, we gather this information. So I'll talk about sexy stuff around marketing, but in doing so, I'll just tease out some of the key metrics for you. It won't, like the GVA forms look horrible. How about I design something cool that won't look like a GVA form, but you get the GVA data? They ran, so, so I'll tell you what, what happened in the end. So basically it, it worked out. And this agency really wanted this, this gig because it meant talking at 15 events across the UK to anywhere between 50 and 250 people who were their target clients at the time. So they really wanted this gig. And when it come, came to the moment where Business Link said, obviously we need to discuss fees. They braced themselves thinking, how much? And Business Link said, obviously we'll pay you for your time. And my client went, inside they're thinking, I can't believe they're going to pay us for something that I'd be willing to pay for. But in that moment, they just composed themselves and went, plus expenses? <laughs> <laughs> so they got paid. They got paid to do their marketing. They picked up a load of clients as a result. Business Link got what they wanted, which was their, their stats. Everyone ha was happy, and the attendees had a really, really good time and got a load of really great value. So everyone won from that scenario. It was quite neat. It was just a lovely story about understanding when you are building partnerships, what is it that, that people want. One of our clients did something quite cool when it came to bartering. They were an SEO agency, and they really wanted to talk at this SEO event. So they spoke to the organizers and said, how many tickets are you planning on selling? And they said, about 200. They said, OK, what happens if I can increase that by 10%? Would you be interested? Of course, yeah. I'd definitely be interested if you could increase that by 10%. They said, here's the deal. I'll, increase, I'll sell 20 tickets for you. I don't want any money, don't want a commission fee. In return, what I'd really like is a speaking slot. And I want to use this as a case study for how I generated you these extra 20 tickets. <gasps> so cool. So everyone won from that scenario. The organizer got an extra 20 tickets sold. There was some content created, a story behind it. This agency got a speaking slot, got to really test themselves as well. It was a fun little project they got the whole team involved with. Got quite famous locally as the guys that did this. And then just then repeated the trick around similar events around the country. You're all in marketing services here. You all have the opportunity to do this. Go to an event organizer and help them get more people come to their event. And in return, you don't want money. Just a chance to, to speak. Really simple, really easy. All you need to do is ask. And there's tons of opportunities. You can search, meet up, Eventbrite, Facebook. It's all there for you, waiting tomorrow. And someone's going to do this, by the way. One person, or hopefully more than one person in this room, is going to capture the opportunity and do this. And that's what's really exciting. Now, if going to someone else's event uh, it, or isn't it an immediate opportunity for you, then you can organize your own events. And when I was thinking about who is the best at organizing their events, I, there was one particular agency that sprung to mind. And I dropped them an email yesterday saying, is it all right if I talk about you? And they, they said yes. And then I've just realized, or realized earlier, they're here tonight. So rather than me talk about what they did and how good it was, Danny, do you mind saying a few words? Because this is what Danny has done. Uh, yes, please do. So if you just talk about what you did, why you did it, and what the results were. It's taking my five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Daft Assumptions was an idea I had about six or seven years ago, and it came off some, um, some talk I listened to about creating a lead generating magnet, which was about creating some 
content that people would exchange their information for, to download, etc. But then I parked it for whatever reason for about five, five or six years. And about maybe six months ago, we decided that we need to do some marketing. So we're, we're a small agency, about 11 people. We, you know, all our work is word of mouth. Um, and we just thought, look, you know, I'm going to start raising our profile. Um, and we were wondering what the, what the right way of doing that was. Didn't want to go down traditional channels, and we thought, you know, Huddle Crazy, that's, that's the agency, built on collaboration, all about bringing people together and doing stuff. So we thought, let's, let's, let's create this event series. Uh, we were very conscious of what we didn't want to do is, is, is do that thing that agency creates an event, gives it a name, captures an audience, sells to that audience. We just didn't want it to feel like that. It just wasn't, it just didn't feel right for us. And we didn't think it would work, to be honest. So we, we created a new brand called After Assumptions. Very kind of interchangeable. It was a very quite flexible thing. So it was all about, you know, Dart Assumptions X make when doing Y. So it could be quite broad, it could be quite niche. Um, and we've been doing it for something like two or three months. We've had we've done two sort of general events, one kind of masterclass event, and it's been brilliant. I mean, you know, really uh, positive in terms of lead generation, in terms of the quality of the conversation that we're having with people, um, and the general sort of halo effect it has had on broadening the conversation from we're a service provider, you're a client, let's do some business to we're kind of all in this together, let's share some thoughts, experiences, some pain, some ideas. Um, and you know, our, 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 at the core of what we do is all about being kind of honest. And it's just an honest, very true reflection of how we think and how we feel. So I think the one of the key things is um, it's, it's not explicitly a marketing ploy, which I think people are very aware of, very savvy that, you know, uh, that you know, people do these things to try and capture them and sell to them. So, um, so it's kind of authentic in that respect, that it's, that it's generally for the kind of greater good rather than just for generating leads. So the generating <coughs> leads is almost like incidental to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a reflection or it gives people a taster of what we actually do because one of our things is we, we, we do this thing called a huddle hack which is like a fast paced innovation thing. We do a little bit of that in the, in the session so it's not just kind of one person talking to an audience, it's people getting involved and actually creating stuff together. Um, and it's, uh, it's been incredible in actually um, creating conversations to people who are, you know, if you looked at the, their LinkedIn profile as global head of marketing for whatever, big, big global brand, and I'm on the phone to them saying, do you want to speak at our panel, but do you want to, do you want to get involved in this? And I love it, love to get involved, I'm away in Germany next week, but definitely for the next one, you know, that's, that's the type of conversation that I'm having with these people. So even if they don't turn up, uh, to these events, or even if they don't participate in a panel discussion, the communication line is, is there, and you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen. So, awesome. Yeah. I, I've, I've seen the halo effect of, of these events, I've seen the chatter around it. I'd encourage you to take a look because this is, I believe, the benchmark for what agencies should, should be doing in terms of organizing your own events. So, and one, one final point, Peter, which I think is quite important, well, quite relevant given that we're all kind of agency owners is, I've had agency owners come to us who specialise in a particular uh, field, particular market. We're quite generalist to be quite honest. I mean, you know, you'll be quite angry with us because we're, <laughs> we're kind of like, yeah, we'll do anything for any, anyone. But, <laughs> but um, they like, they're specialists in retail or whatever it is. And they'll be like, let's do an event together. So last week we did an event with, uh, a writing agency and it was about how do you write, how do marketing people write, or daft assumptions marketing people make when writing content. And 
uh, that's generated, already generated work for them. It will almost definitely generate uh, work for us. But it's not just about getting clients, it's about building relationships with, uh, with, with agencies that you can, you can you know, you can come together and with complementary skill sets and offer more value than just an agency on, it, on its own. So, yeah. Definitely awesome. Do it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Danny. That was brilliant. That was handy, because you did it a lot better than yeah. I would have done. <laughs> so the, my final tip is, is this. It's the most important one. If you're really serious about this, and I, I have to be honest, why wouldn't you be? If you, you're all here to help grow your agencies. You're all here looking for, hopefully, more of the ideal clients, the better projects, the bigger pipelines of work. Then I'd encourage you all to just do one thing. We should just get on and do something as a result of today. It might be something that Mark has talked about that you think you're going to really, really work on. It might be you've been inspired to run your own event or get in touch with someone who runs uh, another event. But whatever it is that you do, please do something as a result of this this evening, because then it would have been a really worthwhile use of, of time. Now, I know there's challenges with that. So I get, uh, I get to work with so many agencies. And I know how busy you guys are, phenomenally busy. So I understand how sometimes the best of intentions get caught up with the day-to-day -day of running your agencies, running projects, managing the teams. So I have someone that's available for hire to help you refocus at those moments where you forget what's important. So today, hopefully, I see a lot of you taking notes. You're thinking, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Well, tomorrow, if you need a little reminder, I have someone called Terry who's available for hire who will help you Remember what's important when you lapse in your concentration. Here's a, a little clip of Terry in action. When we asked Reebok to send us Terry Tate, some people thought we were crazy. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. It went. Break was over 15 minutes ago, match! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. <laughs> and getting more from our employees than ever before. You know you need a cover sheet on your TPS reports, Richard! That ain't new, baby! Hey, Terry. Hey, Janice. Huh? But what's really impressive is how Terry's become part of the Belcher family. <laughs> I wish Reebok sent us 10 Terry Tates. That is about 10 years old, that video. It just brought back some nice nostalgia there, playing solitaire, when solitaire was the only thing that could distract our members of the team in, in the office. Rory doesn't even know, Rory works for me, but I doesn't even know what solitaire is. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for your attention this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Marcus and I are going to hang around for, for questions uh, afterwards. So if I just hand back over to, to Daniel, who's going to explain a little bit more about what we've got coming up for, for members. But if you would like to talk to us, then yeah, please give us a shout. And good luck implementing whatever it is you decide to do. Thanks.